We appreciate you all coming here, and uh, uh, we have a great speaker, uh, very dynamic, uh, ready to, to kick us off for the coming election. Uh, to give kind of a full overview of who it is we have speaking to us here today, I want to introduce our voice in the United States Senate, a man who we know very well. Please uh, join me in welcoming to the stage uh, Senator Mike Crapo. Well, thank you very much, Trent. It truly is great to be in Idaho. You all know this uh, because you live here and you get to enjoy this incredible spot of the world that we get to live in ourselves. I have that opportunity in the Senate to leave and go back to the swamp every once in a while. And it truly is great to be out here with you. Blackfoot is a great community. And thank you to the Republicans of Bingham County and Southeast Idaho for organizing this event. We need the message that Rob Lett is going to bring to us today. The entire country needs this message, and I'm glad that Idaho has such an outstanding speaker and an outstanding leader in this effort who's going to join us today. Uh, we need everybody's involvement at all levels of government. Outspoken, devastatingly accurate, and understandable, Rob Lett has drawn national attention as a defender of conservative American values. Originally from New York, Rob Lett had little interest in politics as a child. Both his parents were hardworking and invested in real estate as a hobby. Taking a cue from his parents, he pursued higher education with the intention to go into real estate as a career. His bachelor's degree focused in computer and information sciences and support services from Athens State University. Once in the job market, Rob became an experienced national trainer and professional communicator on issues important to real estate sellers, short sales, property, and, uh, property management, real estate swaps, and investment properties. He most recently served as a spokesman and representative for some of the investment professionals who appear regularly as a part of ABC's Shark Tank TV show. It was his experience as an investor and international speaker that sparked his interest in politics, supporting George W. Bush as his first vote for a Republican candidate for president. Today he resides in Marietta, Georgia, supporting conservative candidates who promote personal freedom, free market capitalism, and individual responsibility. A national spokesperson on finance and investment, Rob Lett has traveled America promoting the societal good born out of free markets and private investment. He calls out the hypocrisy of the political left, the self-appointed great humanitarians, as they advocate policies that leave millions destitute and struggling to capture their American dream. Rob Lett is leading in the charge to defend conservative, American values. And I have to say to you, Rob, I am so glad that you're here bringing that message to Idaho. We get it, we understand it, and we appreciate you coming here to advocate it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rob Lett. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Do I have it? We were fine. How's everyone doing? First of all, thank you, Senator, and also I want to say thank you to uh, Trent Clark and the Southeast Republicans for inviting me. Uh, when you're making these videos online, you don't really know if you're just making them in a vacuum or if anyone's watching, so thank you guys for watching. So one of the things that uh, I am accustomed to doing is I am accustomed to, oh, let me make sure of this thing, hold on one second. Yeah, I was going to say, one of the things that I'm accustomed to doing is I'm accustomed to actually laying out an agenda before I speak. So several things that I'm going to go through today is I'm going to talk about who I am for the benefit of anyone who hasn't heard of me before. I just run a little YouTube channel, so I totally understand. I'm also going to talk about how my profession, uh, you just heard uh, Senator talk about my profession in real estate, how that ended up being a game changer and actually shaping some of my views. And then I'm going to go right into 
uh, how that also gave me the big picture. I'm going to be talking about what the big picture is in terms of how I view not just the United States, but really the world in terms of Democrat and Republican. You'll see what I'm talking about. Because my background is in sales, I kind of see things in that vein uh, from sales, from a business perspective. And then I'm going to give a little bit of time talking about the history of the parties. And in addition to the history of the parties, I'm going to talk about how we've got ourselves in the situation that we're in right now, which basically comes from selling our freedom. Another thing that I'm going to touch on is the fact that we shouldn't be at the point of selling our freedom because by now we've seen this practice over and over again, so we should have a good idea of the Democrat playbook. And I'm going to talk about the fact that we can do better. And then one of the last things that I'm going to cover is I'm going to cover what I feel is the future. Right, so one of the first things that's really important uh, to accomplish is to provide a little bit of background of the person who's talking to you today. I'm originally from New York. I grew up in the part of New York where a lot of rappers are from, <laughs> which is called Queens. So if you're familiar with, with Queens, it's the home of rappers like Run DMC. I also didn't live too far away from a place called Farmers Boulevard, and that is where LL Cool J is from, if any of you are familiar with LL Cool J. Queens is also the neighborhood of 50 Cent and many more. Uh, so when, what I'm trying to tell you is it's not exactly the breeding ground for Republicans. That's what I'm trying to give you an idea of, okay? All right, so I grew up really in a modest house uh, with a hardworking middle-class pa middle parents. My mom was a nurse. My dad was in air conditioning and refrigeration. Uh, in that kitchen of that little house, I remember my mom had a sign up. And that sign said on the wall, it says, we have done so much with so little for so long, we believe we could do anything with nothing at all in no time flat. That kind of gives you an idea of our work ethic. So on the side of my parents' day jobs, uh, they worked in real estate. They invested in real estate. I really didn't pay much attention to what my parents were doing uh, in their off hours until one day a big Mercedes pulled up into the driveway. And that's when I really started paying attention to what my parents were doing in their off hours. You know, you just want to make sure things are legitimate, right? So I immediately, upon seeing the car pull up, I said, I know exactly what I want to do in my life. I want to be a real estate investor. But you know how parents are. The moment you start talking about something that can make you any money, parents have this unique way of busting your bubble and saying, that's great, but you still want to go to college, so at least you'll have something to. I see you got the same talk, right? And so, as a result, I have two degrees, as you heard Senator mention. I have an associate's in industrial electronics, and I also have a bachelor's in computer information systems. I don't know why it stands out in my mind, but the day that I graduated from high school, I distinctly remember sitting in that house, and I remember it soaking in that I was about to be an adult. And so, for the first time, I remember asking myself, am I a Democrat? Or am I a Republican? I don't know why my mind went there. When you're an only child, you do a lot of talking to yourself. <laughs> and so I remember even as a kid feeling like the Democrat Party was dishonest. They pretend like there's something wrong with wealth, but all the while, they're pursuing it. I felt at least with the Republican Party, they were honest about the fact that they wanted to succeed in life. And I made no apologies about that. Looking back, I feel like we were all raised Republicans. The problem is we just don't embrace it. Every decent family raised you to work hard for what you want and not steal from someone else. Every decent family raised you to increase your worth in the marketplace by learning a trade or skill and not expecting a handout. Every decent family I knew advised their children to keep their mind on their schoolwork and not have sex because having a child at a young age could change your future dramatically. Notice abortion wasn't even part of that conversation. It was a given back then that you were going to take responsibility for your child. These are values most of us were raised with. So why have they become so controversial? Eventually, I moved to Atlanta. I worked nearly five years in the corporate world before I decided to resign and pursue my real estate career. I'd been investing successfully on the side, and one day I looked up and asked myself a question that I hadn't asked before. I said, I wonder what this job is costing me. And I did something really bold. What I did is I typed up a resignation email. I typed it up as though I were quitting today. I appreciate the opportunity you gave me, all that stuff. And I let the email sit in my draft folder. 
And I said, if one more good thing happens in real estate investing, I'm going to click send on that email. And it just so happens that I did a real estate deal, made quite a bit of money, and I decided to click send on that email. And I said, well, it's a funny thing about email. Once you click send, you can't, you can't get that email back. And I said, I better start walking over to my supervisor's office because he's gonna get this email any second. And so I walk over into my supervisor's office and I say, I'm upping my income, so up yours. No, I didn't say that. I didn't. I just wanted to see where you're listening. I would never say that. No, I said, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I said, I just feel like I've got a higher calling. There's something that I wanted to do. And they said, well, we appreciate you working with us. July 5th of 2000 was my last day on the job. I wanted it to be Independence Day, but we didn't work that day anyway, so it didn't work out. <laughs> okay. So after quitting the IT field, I hit the ground running and I started buying properties. Sometimes I sold them, sometimes I leased them. I was having so much success with real estate that I was asked to appear on panels and even host evenings with an expert. Eventually, I became an international speaker for the names and brands that you would know, some of the people on Shark Tank. So my speaking style may feel a little bit interactive at times. That's a throwback from my seminar days. I don't view today really as me talking to you as much as I view it as having a conversation with you. Does that make sense? So earlier I told you I feel like I resonated more with Republicans, but by this time I had already ignored all those feelings and unfortunately I voted for the smooth saxophone playing of Bill Clinton. It turns out I only knew what I thought Republicans were, the party of the rich. So when faced with a smooth talker, I did like most Americans, I voted against my initial gut feeling. But everything was about to change. By the end of Clinton's term, I was deeply entrenched in the real estate business. I had developed a wealth of experience. I had been an employee, I had been an employer, I had been a tenant, I had been a landlord. I had been a buyer, I had been a seller, both the student and the teacher. I had been broke and I had a lot of money. I saw the world from so many different levels but differently from my friends. I was developing skills to more clearly see the difference between the parties. For the first time, I voted for my principles and I was experiencing this in real life. So my first vote for Republican, I voted for George W. Bush. <laughs> I was still just a budding conservative though. My knowledge of politics was still very much centered around business, finance. But with time, I began to see the bigger picture. Is anyone here familiar with soft power, the phrase? It's okay if you're not. It's not like I've heard the phrase for a long time. I just found out about it just a few years ago. I'm a bit of a nerd, so I tend to read and watch all sorts of topics online that I find interesting. One of the videos that I watched was a documentary about the dangers of women wearing makeup in North Korea. As you already know, North Korea is the communist dynasty. Their freedom is so restricted that the women of North Korea can only wear hairstyles and clothing that have been pre-approved by the government. The documentary I watched was discussing how the women in capitalist South Korea smuggle makeup called K-beauty into North Korea because of the huge demand there. Uh, one of those women is Dawn B. Kim, who smuggled makeup into North Korea, and she's been doing that since she was age 14. Women in North Korea caught disobeying those beauty standards are publicly shamed, they can be arrested, and that's if you're lucky. Dombey was beaten up and she was tortured for her disobedience. The women of North Korea are so isolated from the outside world that many of them don't even know what lipstick is. When they order it, they ask for the thing to paint on lips. Blush is referred to as the thing that makes cheeks red. With such a strict government in North Korea, you might wonder, well, how in the world do the women in North Korea even know about K-beauty? Great question. It's called the K-wave, which stands for the Korean wave. It's a culture of Korean boy bands, girl bands, K-dramas, and films. Now, the K-wave has been extremely popular, so popular, in fact, that the South Korean government funds the growth of K-beauty. Now, I've given you a lot, but the one thing I still haven't given you yet is the definition of soft power. You probably thought I forgot. 
In international relations, if we talk about soft power, uh, that's usually in contrast to what we call hard power. So when we talk about hard power, we normally think of something like, you know, bombs, guns, uh, military might. When we talk about soft power, we're trying to use the power of attraction to get the counterpart to do what we would think is desirable behavior. So if hard power is forcing people to like you, mm -hmm. soft power is getting them to like you. Yeah. Everyone asks me, so what does this have to do with the United States? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so in the United States, there's a famous quote that I'm starting to hear more and more often, and it's actually a quote from Andrew Breitbart. You may want to even write it down. The quote says, politics is downstream from culture. If you're wondering why I spent so much time explaining the dynamics of women's makeup between South and North Korea, it's because there's a method to my madness. So many people uh, say politics is downstream from culture, but nobody ever asked the follow-up question, and that is, well, who sets the culture? We all know there's a war being fought right now, but not everyone knows what the battlefield is. The battlefield is over culture. Didn't you find it interesting that the South Korean government was willing to fund a Korean makeup company? Isn't it even more interesting that despite armed guards in communist North Korea, they've still failed to keep their citizens from smuggling in makeup and music and films from South Korea? This is soft power. This is how wars are won without ever firing a shot by winning the hearts and minds of a nation. Every business owner wears many hats. You're the manager, you're the accountant, you're the marketing department and more when you run your own business. When I was running a real estate business, I had someone tell me something about marketing that stuck with me till this day. Someone on Twitter once told me, when a media company comes to your town, they buy three things almost instantly. They buy a billboard, they buy a radio station, and a television station. So when you're stuck in traffic, let's just say, you'll see a billboard saying, tune in to WROB on your FM dial. So the billboard leads you to turn on your radio, and your radio will undoubtedly tell you to tune in to Channel 5 for the complete story by the time you get home. And just like that, whether you realize it or not, you're in someone's funnel. These are sales terms, for those of you who don't like sales. Is there anyone here in sales? Okay? I love salespeople. I love being around salespeople. I love salespeople because we speak a language that most people don't understand. It's the language of influence. There are a lot of people who don't like salespeople. As a matter of fact, they'll even tell you sometimes, man, I can't stand salespeople. But I like salespeople because salespeople know something that most of you don't. I've got five words I want to give you that every salesperson knows, but some of you don't know. So you may want to write it down. Are you ready for my five words? Everyone is always selling something. Say it with me. Everyone is always selling something. So when someone asks you later, what did Rob talk about? Say, yes, the title was Freedom Was Never Free. But if you really want them to understand what I talked about today, tell them those five words. Say, Rob reminded us that everyone is always selling something. There's a rumor out there that says, if what you have is really good, then you wouldn't have to sell it. Yeah, that's bull. When I told my barber I was coming here to talk to you, he immediately told me a story of these two kids who was trying to raise money for some sort of stomp group to offset some expenses for school. They were dressed up professionally in ties, and my barber asked a question in the building of everyone around, and he says, does anyone want to donate? Everyone was silent. He asked the kids, what is a stomp group? Why don't you just show us what you mean? Suddenly, the kids put down their paperwork and they started dancing. Before you know it, everyone in the crowd started giving them money. My barber said, I bet you won't sell it any other way from now on. The point I want you to understand is show people what you mean. You're in sales, whether you think you are or not. You better know because I guarantee your competitor knows. Let me give you an example. Whenever I hear something new, something brand new, or the story isn't matching up to something I know to be true, I put the brakes on because I suspect I'm being sold something. Now, I don't mind being sold something. 
Everybody is always selling something. I just want to know what it is you're selling. One of the most popular shows on my channel is the one that's called There Was No Party Switch. I made it because I heard something that sounded improbable. I'm, it made me wonder, what is being sold and why? The narrative being sold was that there was a party switch at some point in history. Let's stop there for a second. I mean, we're all adults here, so we all know there was a civil war in the United States. Some call it the war between the states. But can we call it what it was, shall we? It was really the war between Republicans and Democrats. And Democrats lost. So right there, it should make you pause, because this story about the party switch is suspiciously only being told by Democrats. The question is why? I've already covered this in more detail on my channel. I don't have much time today because I want to cover additional topics, but let me do my best to explain to you the dilemma that Democrats found themselves in, why they found it necessary to lie, and what soft power has to do with all of this. Earlier, I said I put the brakes on whenever there's a story that doesn't match up to something I already know to be true. So let me give you an example of something I know to be true. With the billboard example I mentioned earlier, I showed you how easy it is to get caught up in a sales funnel, an information loop, if you will, all pushing the same message. Fortunately for us, as easy as it was for you to get in the funnel, it's just as easy for you to come out, if you know where to look. Statues and monuments have been around for a long time, so they're fixed. It's harder to spin a new narrative when something is fixed. Most of the time when we're in the park, we just walk around and we never inquire about those statues and monuments and who their depictions of or what those people's backgrounds were. But this is Stone Mountain. It's located in Georgia, where I live. We learned that the people carved on the side of that mountain were the leaders of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, and Thomas Jonathan Jackson, better known as Stonewall Jackson. They were Democrats. We also learned that Abraham Lincoln, our 16th pre president who issued the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, promoted the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, freed the slaves and abolished slavery, was a Republican. Now you have to be wise enough to see why the Democrats of today were in a pickle. How could they ever get in power? I mean, they have to be likable. Yet, there are these things out there called facts that show Republicans freed the slaves, amended the Constitution to make it so, while the Democrats owned slaves and nearly destroyed the country with their ideology and practices. Hmm. So how do you convince voters today that you're not the same KKK party of the past? The answer is, you lie with a little help from soft power. You say, yes, that was the Democrat Party in the past, but something happened. The parties switched. And today, the Democrats are the party of peace and love and tolerance, while the Republican Party, Democrats say, are the party of racism. Remember what you learned. Soft power is designed to make you likable, for people to see your side. Soft power in and of itself isn't a bad thing, it's just persuasion. In the case of South Korea, they were persuading women to be free. Freedom isn't a bad thing. But just like any tool, soft power can also be used for bad purposes. Remember what we said about the billboard, the radio, and the television station? Well, I'll add to that today, I'll add newspapers, websites, art, and apps. I'll show you how these all play a role. There are tools that Democrats have used to sell a lie, and this lie is that they are a different party from their racist past. I'll submit to you that the only way they're different today is that they're more cunning. They've learned that racism doesn't sell, so they try to push their agenda a different way. You might say, wait a minute, Rob, I thought you were trying to say that racism was their agenda. No, racism just happens to be an offshoot of their real agenda. Their real agenda is socialism. When a Democrat or a Democrat sympathizer hears me speak on this subject, they're first criticized, criticized, 
Their first criticism would be, oh, that's an oversimplification of what happened. The party switch was more complicated than that. Well, first of all, as I said, there was no party switch. And second of all, no, it's not more complicated than that. Complexity is the smokescreen that Democrats use to make you second guess your gut. It's actually quite simple. Let me explain why. I used to, just like many of you, I used to engage in these lengthy debates about the so-called party switch that never went anywhere. The other side would throw out so much data that by the time we were done, we were so far down the rabbit hole that you could easily forget what you were debating in the first place. I learned to stop playing that game. One reason is because it never solved anything, but the main reason is because I didn't have to play that game anymore. The reason why is because something happened in 2016 that changed everything. Have you noticed how extreme the left has gotten all of a sudden? When I mentioned this to my barber, he said, define extreme. I said, uh, belief that there are 72 genders? Uh, one out of five Democrats believe men can get pregnant? Uh, men competing in women's sports? Uh, men incarcerated in women's prisons? My list was longer than this, but you get the gist. How did the left get so extreme so quickly? Well, until 2016, the Democrat Party had been carrying a secret around for decades, and occasionally, somebody would let that secret slip. What guarantees are you going to give this liberal about how that will reduce the cost of uh of uh, gasoline at the pump if we let you drill where you say you want to drill. I can guarantee to the American people because of the inaction of the United States Congress ever increasing prices unless the demand comes down and the five dollars will look like a very low price in the years to come if we are prohibited from finding new reserves, new opportunities to increase supplies. And guess what this liberal would be all about? This liberal will be all about socializing. Uh, um, would be about um, basically taking over and the government running all of your companies. Did you see that? Did you see the word she stumbled over? Socialize. She stuttered and was almost speechless when she realized she used the word socialize in public. She immediately tried to correct and find a softer word to replace it. But why replace it? Socialize is just one word. Taking over is two. But she's not the only one. We have to say yes to socialism, to the word and everything. We have to say yes to socialism, to the word and everything. Yes to socialism, to the word and everything. Well, aren't you implying that there was something wrong with the word in the first place? Well, if you look at Maxine Waters' response, I guess there was. But 2016 changed all of that. After spending a lifetime avoiding the S word, along comes a candidate named Bernie Sanders, who ruined it for the Democrat Party. He was the first candidate that I've seen in modern time to openly say he was running as a socialist. Notice he wasn't running as an independent. He wasn't running as a Republican. Nope, he ran with the party he thought was best aligned with his views. He ran with the Democrat Party. And right after he announced he was a socialist, AOC says, I am too. Then Beto O'Rourke, Andrew Gillum, Elon Omar, and the list just kept on growing. It was as if they had been keeping a secret for so long that they were tired of lying about it. Remember how I said it's interesting that only a, the left pushes this party switch narrative? It's also interesting that only the left considers the word socialism practically a curse word. Well, now that the secret's out, we know the Democrat Party has been secretly socialist this entire time. It's time to reopen this so-called party switch can of worms to determine why they've kept this secret for so long in the first place. But before I go back in time, let's just put a placeholder here so that we can remember that Democrats are socialists today. Now let's go back. The first book in the English language to contain the word sociology in the title was a book called Sociology for the South. It was written by a man named George Fitzhugh. 
Now, Fitzhugh was a social theorist who published racial and slavery-based social theories in the 1800s. He actually had wrote several books. But the quote I'd like to call your attention to is the one where Fitzhugh was trying to justify why he thought slavery was good for the slaves. Can I see it there? Maybe I'll have to read it from here. He says, slavery relieves our slaves of these cares altogether. And slavery is a form and the very best form of socialism. So in his mind, slavery allowed someone to provide for them and to relieve the slaves of responsibility. If you can read between the lines, what Fitzy was telling his readers is that he believed slavery was good because it meshed with the higher standard of something called socialism. Now, without getting too bogged down here, socialism is a philosophy made popular by German philosopher, sociologist, political theory, uh, political theorist Karl Marx. It's a political and economic theory that's heavily based on class distinctions and revolution. The revolution Marx always sold was the coming revolution of the proletariat class versus the bourgeois wealthy class, rich versus poor. If this rich versus poor narrative sounds familiar, it should, because it's the narrative the Democrat Party still uses today. But I still haven't gotten to the real reason why the Democrats cover up their history with the S word. I mentioned Karl Marx was a German philosopher. Well, if Americans are fascinated with a German philosopher, well, surely there are Germans who must be fascinated with it as well. One such German was a man by the name of Adolf Hitler. Now, for those of you with pen and paper, write this down. There's a film you should look up. It's called A Night at the Garden. I honestly don't even like mentioning Hitler because too many people throw his name around whenever there's somebody that they just don't like. I'm aware that just the mention of his name today possibly waters down my message. I get that, and that's unfortunate because there's really no way for me to avoid the truth. Most Americans are raised with this view that the atrocities of Hitler are occurrences that happened over there. And those crazy things that Hitler believed in happened over there. But hear me on this. On February 20th, 1939, Madison Square Garden was host to a Nazi rally. That's right. Not over there, right here in the United States. Some 20,000 people attended during the FDR administration. FDR was a huge fan of Mussolini, and Mussolini was Hitler's mentor. The big secret, the reason why Maxine Waters stutters saying the S word, the reason why Jim Carrey implies there was something wrong with the word socialism at some point in our history, is because Democrats never wanted to be known that they were ever in agreement with Mussolini and Hitler. It's fashionable for Democrats to call Trump a dictator today, but what they don't tell you is that the only president who ever served more than two terms was FDR. We all know it wasn't Trump. FDR served four consecutive terms. He wanted to take a page from the dictator handbook. The only thing that ended FDR's term is that he died in office. So if you go back far enough, you'll see that the Democrats were socialists then, and they're socialists now. I can't see where they've switched at all. Do you? So all I see is that they've managed to silence one aspect of socialism, and that aspect is racism. I had a conversation with my Lyft driver one evening. I live a long way from the airport. So during the ride, we talked, and we ended up talking about politics in the middle of this discussion. In the middle of the discussion, he discovered that I'm a conservative, and that's when the conversation really got interesting. He and I were both black. Well, I still am. Um, But he was having a hard time processing how I could be black and still be a conservative. And I told him that I enjoyed the conversation. I mean, we weren't having an argument. It was a genuine conversation. When he got to my house, he told me that I couldn't get out because the conversation was so interesting. He just had some questions but he tried desperately to appeal to the fact that I'm black. He says, Rob, don't you think there's just something about white people? I said, listen, I've enjoyed our conversation, 
and I really have to go. But I'll leave you with this last thought to ponder. In communist China, where there's barely a white man in sight, do you think the problem is really the white man? In North Korea, do you think the white man is the problem? What about Haiti, Venezuela, Cuba? In every one of those instances, what they all have in common is that they share an ideology that you as the individual don't matter. It's all about the collective. It's about the community. And as long as you buy into that way of thinking, those societies are comfortable that they can do anything to you without recourse, so long as it's for the good of the group. All you remember are the white confederates who fought for slavery during the Civil War, but you're totally forgetting the 360,000 Union soldiers, many of them white, who died so that you and I can be free. So I ask you, is enemy your, excuse me, is color your real enemy? Or is it a mindset? And I got out. I took the time to crush his thought pattern because he couldn't see he was attempting to fight racism with more racism. And the sad part is racism isn't even the real enemy. It's socialism. Racism is just a symptom, and a lot of people are running around infected with it. When you understand the history of the party and the ideologies they support, it's more easily able to identify that soft power is being used to sell you something every day. I see conservatives using phrases like the alt-right, when the truth of the matter is there's really no such thing as the alt-right. We can talk about that offline. I've seen the media prop up Jussie Smollett's of the world fraudulently in an attempt to push Marxism because that's all they were. Both Jussie Smollett and Richard Spencer, both socialists, who were given a platform to undermine capitalism in a free society during Trump's term. It's the soft revolution. I'm not saying that there aren't any racists in the Republican Party. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that if you feel that way, please get out. You are not a Republican. You're not a conservative. You don't have a home here. Identitarian politics are socialists. Force is not the offspring of the free market. Force is the offspring of Marxism. So if you're part of some society that believes this garbage, you should really just get out and become a Democrat. Because fundamentally, there's no difference between your view and George Fitzhugh's. You may think that all of this soft power stuff that I'm talking about is something I've made up in order to have a speech. I hope you don't. Because if you don't think we're in a culture war, then explain to me how this used to be our culture. We had a society so proud with so much etiquette that we didn't even show you the bedroom of a married couple on national television. Now I'm looking around, I don't see anyone under age here. But the reason I'm asking that is because, well, this is the Democrat Senator, Tiara Mack of Rhode Island. If you can't see there's been a change in our culture, you need your head examined. I really debated on whether or not I would show you the video or just the photo. In the end, I thought the video might be a bit much. and I'm even embarrassed to show you the photo, but I really wanted you to see just how serious this is, so I kept it. It's no surprise there's been an attack on our culture. When you list most of the media that we interact with on a daily basis, the conservative viewpoint has been in the minority. Most of the mainstream media are biased to the left, and yet the left screams about the handful just Fox News, about the handful of media that we have as though we have a ton of them. But even the best funnels have cracks in them. As much as the mainstream media tries to sell their leftist narrative, if you study enough, you'll occasionally see where someone let the truth slip out. The mainstream media tries their best to pretend that there were no black Republicans. But I watched this movie about Harriet Tubman and I wondered how many people noticed the uniforms of the people she were fighting with. They were Union soldiers. She fought with Republicans, which means she fought against Democrats. There's another scene where they show someone who looks to be most likely Frederick Douglass in the Underground Railroad. Again, working with Harriet Tubman means Frederick Douglass, too, was fighting against Democrats. Now, these messages are hard to find on purpose. In leftist propaganda, 
all blacks are Democrat. And if you're not, well, you must be a sellout. If you don't believe that, you should read the news story in California where they labeled Larry Elder the black face of white supremacy. I can't make this up. Does this look like the black face of white supremacy to you? <laughs> and that's why my channel exists. To find these times when the media slips up and they report something they didn't mean to and it backfires. I take lemons and I share lemonade with my subscribers. A perfect example of that is Clarence Thomas's Second Amendment opinion this year. I made a show explaining the brilliance of how Clarence Thomas's opinion actually crushed the Democrats in about four different ways. So let me read to you in case you've never read this before. A short prologue is in order. Even before the Civil War commenced in 1861, this court indirectly affirmed the importance of the right to keep and bear arms in public. Chief Justice Taney offered what he thought was a parade of horribles that would result from recognizing that free blacks were citizens of the United States. If blacks were citizens, Taney fretted, they would be entitled to privileges and immunities of citizens, including the right to keep and carry arms wherever they went. Thus, even Chief Justice Taney recognized, albeit unenthusiastically in the case of blacks, that public carry was a component of the right to keep and bear arms, a right free blacks were often denied in antebellum America. Hmm. Okay, so first, let me go back. First, he used the words of the Democrat Party. Let me go back. First of all, he used the words of the Democrat parties in the past to overturn Democrat policies today. I thought that was brilliant, using the Democrats' word back then to overturn the ones today. But second, Justice Thomas confirmed that what I've been telling you this whole time, that Democrats did everything in their power to deny blacks their civil rights. Here, Democrat Justice Roger B. Taney was on the highest court in the nation. And he obviously was upset about the fact that blacks had rights that were equal to blacks had rights that were equal to whites. Third, and there's such an irony in this one, just by referencing the Civil War, Thomas made me think of how Republicans saved America back then by issuing the Emancipation Proclamation, protecting our country from the policy of slavery promoted by Democrats. Republicans saved us back then. And then when I read Thomas's decision this year, I thought it was ironic that here was yet another Republican, Justice Thomas, protecting the rights of all Americans from Democrats denying us the right to defend ourselves. Fourth, just so happened this year that the Supreme Court made two landmark decisions, if you paid attention. Both of those decisions showed you just how much Democrats were the exact same party that they've always been. SCOTUS upheld the decision for Americans to be able to defend themselves, and they also upheld the Dobbs decision, taking the power out of the hands of the federal government and returning it back to the states. In summary, Justice Thomas made it clear that the Democrats today hold the exact same positions that they held in 1857 to keep blacks from depending, defending themselves, and to also make sure they don't reproduce. Now, if you don't understand that second part, you should really look up the history of Margaret Sanger, because she's the founder of Planned Parenthood, who Democrats still fight for to this day. But if you've ever read one of Sanger's letters, you would do a double take. The minister's work is also important and also should be trained, perhaps by the Federation, as to our ideals and the goal that we hope to reach. We do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population, and the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. Hmm. So, I find it interesting, the people who call me a sellout, and yet their pastor, Raphael Warnock, somehow manages to put God to the side in exchange for votes. 
Mark Twain once said, the trouble with the world isn't that people know too little, it's that they believe in so many things that just isn't so. As I told you, for much of my life, I didn't follow politics. I just knew in some cursory way that Democrats were responsible for our civil rights. I'll challenge you to study to see if that's really true. The Democrat Party was the party of the racist Dixiecrats all the way through to the 1960s. So if the so-called party switch were true, that means you would have seen blacks shift to the Democrat parties in the 70s, right? I mean, we would have seen that all the racists moved from the Democrat Party to the Republican Party, and therefore, blacks would have left the Republican Party to join the Democrat Party. There's only one problem with that. It's a lie. I was doing some research for a show about how Trump affected the black vote. And in doing my research, I think Forbes accidentally gave me more data than I was looking for. Yes, the GOP's share of the black vote was low in 1964, but take a look. Even according to Forbes, that's not when blacks left the Republican Party. First of all, as you can see, at some point in our history, there was just as many blacks in the Republican Party as there are Democrats today. But it's important to know the first big shift from the Republican to Democrat doesn't occur during the 60s, it comes in the 30s. So it should make you ask yourself, well, what happened in the 1930s that made blacks want to leave the Republican Party? I'll come back to this. So the first part isn't true. The overwhelming shift did not occur during the 1960s, it occurred during the 30s. And the second part isn't true either about the Democrat being the champion of civil rights. What most people never discuss is as a country, we've passed more civil rights than just 1964. There was a Civil Rights Act of 1866, a Civil Rights Act of 1957, and the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 was America's first Civil Rights Act. It was a powerful blow by Republicans against white supremacy. Democrat President Johnson vetoed it, but the Republican majority was able to override him. In fact, Republicans were instrumental in all of the Civil Rights Acts that we have. So if you call yourself a Republican and you don't believe every Republican, every American is endowed with unalienable rights, you're not a Republican. Proportionally, more Republicans than Democrats voted for the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, and the Fair Housing Bill. Had Congress been made up entirely of Democrats, none of these laws would have secured the votes to defeat the filibuster, and thus, none of them would have been passed. Hmm. So let's go back here. If you didn't know any of what I just said, you can thank your mainstream soft power media for that. We don't realize the influence of everything that you come in contact with in regards to your opinions. The media have taken it upon themselves to keep you in the funnel so that they can change your minds about how you feel about your own country, so that they can change your mind about what is right and wrong, so that they can change your mind about what is the truth and what is a lie. That's the purpose of Marxism, you know, to destabilize capitalist governments. Marxists want revolution. It's what they teach. Although much of what I've been talking about so far has been in relationship to soft power, counteracting the propaganda from the left, make no mistake, these are serious issues that are all rooted in physical war, hard power. Let's not forget an estimated 620,000 to 750,000 soldiers died with an undetermined number of civilian casualties, meaning the deadliest military conflict in history happened right here on U.S. soil. Don't kid yourself that I go back, went too far. Don't kid yourself. Ah. Don't kid yourself for a second. Why I wanted to mention here is this conflict isn't something that happened a long time ago. I'm 53 years old. I was born in 1969. But just four years prior to that, Stone Mountain Park opened on April 14th, 1965 exactly 100 years to the day of Abraham Lincoln's assassination. You think that grand opening date was a coincidence? 
You don't think that was meant to be a slap in the face to Abraham Lincoln? You don't think that was meant to be a slap in the face to Republicans? Then you don't understand what's at stake. You might wonder how in the world we've lost so much of our family tradition seemingly overnight. Two words, free stuff. Free stuff. When I showed you the charts of blacks leaving the Republican Party in the 1930s, do you know who was president in the 1930s? FDR, the left's hero. Now on October 27th, 2020, Joe Biden did something that was really weird for a presidential candidate. He visited a place called Warm Springs, Georgia. Now everyone knows the reason a presidential candidate would make a stop in Atlanta. I mean, heck, you want votes. The greater Atlanta, area is home to over six million people. That makes sense. But Warm Springs, Georgia is about two hours away from Atlanta and has a population of only 400 people. So why go there? I'll tell you why. Because Warm Springs, Georgia was a virtual home away from home from FDR when FDR was ill. Biden's trip to Warm Springs, Georgia was pure symbolism, plain and simple. The media sold him to you as a centrist who could bring the country together, but his trip to Warm Springs, Georgia was meant to be a nod to socialists that he was honoring their roots. As I mentioned, FDR was the only president to serve four consecutive terms like a dictator. They had to change the rules after he died. FDR was the king of so-called free stuff. In FDR's first 100 days, he passed an unprecedented amount of new legislation, expanding the role of federal government into our lives. So the reason you see so many blacks shifted from the Republican Party to the Democrat Party into the 1930s is because FDR presented the New Deal as though the government was offering some free benefits to blacks, when behind the scenes he was working quietly to exclude blacks from those same benefits. The whole block of Dixiecrat racists went to FDR, all Democrats, by the way, and FDR goes, I need your support for the New Deal. And they go on two conditions. Number one, we have to design the New Deal to cut out blacks. Now, we can't say blacks, so let's exclude agricultural labor and domestic service, which happen to be the two professions in which blacks are heavily occupied. Let's exclude them from Social Security. Let's exclude them from New Deal benefits. FDR agreed. In fact, that's how the programs were written. Demand number two. The Dixiecrats said to FDR, you must also agree to block all anti-lynching laws. Think about this. To block all anti-lynching laws. FDR agreed again. And worked behind the scenes to suppress anti-lynching legislation with the help of Northern Democrats. Northern Democrats. This is very important again because, as you know, in the progressive narrative, there are the following villains. America's to blame. The South is to blame. The white man is to blame. The North is always exempt. And interestingly, the Democratic Party is never mentioned. Much of the worst elements of government were initiated during FDR's administration. We still have them to this day. The Social Security Administration that we complain about all the time was initiated under FDR. So was the minimum wage, welfare, unions, more. Ever since then, the Democrat Party have enticed Americans to exchange their freedom for the promise of something free. Whether it's free health care, free college, when I used to buy real estate foreclosures on the courthouse steps, we'd occasionally encounter protesters who believed that housing was a right. These Democrats pushed for free housing. When I taught financial seminars, I'd sometimes try to get my students to think about something different. I'm not teaching politics in the finance world, but occasionally I'd work something in so that they could think. Whenever I taught them about corporations, I'd pull up a chair and I'd ask my audience a question. I'd say, how much do you think this chair pays in taxes? They'd look at me like I was crazy. Oh, my apologies. I just asked you a silly question. You've got to be thinking, Rob's, Rob, chair doesn't pay taxes. You're absolutely right. They don't. The only thing that pays taxes in this country are people. 
So when the politician tells you you've got to raise taxes on these corporations, you should do your own research because a corporation, all that is is a stack of papers with the Secretary of State. So if a chair can't pay taxes, neither can a stack of papers. There are people involved in a corporation. There are owners, there are shareholders, and outside of the corporation there are employees. Excuse me, there are customers. I want you to be more educated because when someone tells you, suggests to you that you can stick it to the rich, be careful. You may find you just voted for your own tax increase. Nothing is free. Freedom was never free. Everyone is always selling something. Well, someone might say, if everyone is selling something, Rob, then surely you are selling something today then, right? Absolutely. The only difference is I'm selling you something that shouldn't have to be sold because you should already know that you're a child of God. You should already know you were born free. You should already know you have unalienable rights. In the United States, we recognize we can't give you anything you haven't already been born with. It's not our job. Our job is to get out of your way and let your brilliance shine. So it's not so much that I'm trying to sell you anything as much as I'm trying to remind you of your birthright. I love what Herman Cain used to say when reading the Declaration of Independence. He says, too many people stop at the part that says life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He says, don't stop there, because if you read a little further, there's a part that says when any form of government becomes destructive of those ideals, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. Ladies and gentlemen, we have some altering and abolishing to do. If you were to take all of the government regulations we have and stack them up, they'd be taller than me. Which admittedly isn't saying much, but you, you get the gist. So what are we going to do? Enough of the talking. We all know how bad it is. We don't need people explaining to us how bad it is. We've been to the grocery store. We've been to the schools. We've seen the crime. So what do we do? You might not like my answer. I said my background is in sales and business, so I see things from a business and sales perspective. To me, the Democrat Party is just a competitor. You have to outperform competitors. But in order to outperform them, you also have to expose their tactics. You have to expose their playbooks. Revolutionaries thrive on chaos. They thrive on division. The first thing I do is I'd expose the ways that they divide us that the average person doesn't even pay attention to. Democrats love to say that Trump was dividing our country. I educate people on soft power and the things that you might not have noticed. I'm curious about something. How many of you were raised to believe that if you want to keep your friends and family, there are two things that you never talk about? Do y'all remember that? Religion and politics. I just wanted to see. I was just curious to see if I was the only one. Okay? So here's an example of soft power in action. You see, someday you're going to wake up naked, chained to a street like, well, what happened? <laughs> now, what, is, what did you tell me? Oh, I, I had Bill Maher in the other night. You told me you, you, you enjoy his show, too, politically yeah. incorrect. You, you like arguing? I see you don't seem like no, an no, arguing no, no, no. kind of guy. I don't like to argue, but I like uh, open discussions. Yeah. I like the unedited nature of the show. Yeah, yeah. And they, uh, last night was interesting. They were talking about war and... Uh, uh, why there shouldn't be any yeah you know, so it was it was interesting i mean you like to speak your mind what do you want to speak what do you want to talk about is something you want to speak your mind about tonight i want to know if you wanted to get your chair I, I <laughs> how many of you noticed how prince's mood changed just now he went from laughing to very serious and so did the audience in sales we're taught about the power of questions and how you can change a conversation in an instant merely by the questions that you ask. I'm not saying Jay Leno is evil. What I'm saying is the question he asked not only destroyed the mood of the moment, he also purposely asked a question that he knows was designed to divide people. Expose that playbook whenever you see it. Another tactic in the Democrat Party is accusing people of something that they know they're doing themselves. In case you think all of this psychology stuff I'm talking about is theory, you should listen to Nancy Pelosi explain it. You demonize, and then you, it, we call it the wrap-up smear. If you want to talk politics, you call it the wrap-up smear. You smear somebody, 
with falsehoods and all the rest, and then you merchandise it. And then you write it, and they'll say, see, it's reported in the press that this, 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 and this, so they have that validation that the press reported the smear, and then it's called the wrap-up smear. Now I'm going to merchandise the press's report on the smear that we made. And it's, it's a tactic. So Nancy just confirmed what we've been discussing today, a falsehood backed up by soft power to promote it as though it's a real thing. She even told you the name of the tactic. It's called the wrap-up smear. Another tactic I've seen in the Democrat playbook is that they offer to solve the problem that they themselves created. To me, this is like the arsonist who calls the fire department. A perfect example of this is the Inflation Reduction Act. Every chance I get, I'd show a chart on the screen so people can see the Democrats alone are responsible for these spikes in everything, from food to fuel to rent to real estate prices. Why did you allow that party to spend an additional $739 billion to fix a problem that they themselves caused? I'd remind people of that tactic. Now, not in a bragging way, but I'd remind people whenever I ended up being right about something also. It's not hard to do because Democrat policies are very predictable. They want more government control and less individual responsibility. When you understand that, uh, there's a lot of your predictions that will come true. And sooner or later, people will listen to you. Here's an example. For a long time, I've said it's unfair to raise the tax percentage on people just because they make more money. That penalizes people for achievement. And people used to get mad at me. Why do you care? You're not a millionaire. If they have more money, they should pay more. I told people back then, don't kid yourself. The Democrats aren't just after millionaires and billionaires like they always tell you. They're secretly taxing you. You just haven't figured it out yet, like the chair example I mentioned. So be fair, because one of these days, the Democrats won't hide it anymore. For people with just $600, the IRS was looking after their bank accounts. Wouldn't you know it? I was right. And Democrat supporters were shocked. They were so shocked that Biden put the idea on hold. The reason why is because November is coming. But he still snuck it in because remember that Inflation Reduction Act? It paid for 87,000 new IRS agents. So he caused a problem, made you beg for a solution, then offered a fake solution just to get what he want, which was to tax you in the first place. I'd never let people forget that. I'd never let people forget that Biden passed a disinformation governance board under Homeland Security. When I talk about dictatorships, you may think, why should I trust you? You're a conservative. You don't have to trust me. Look it up on your own. Her name was Nina Jankowitz. Her job was to find people who are spreading disinformation and provide enforcement. So in an unprecedented move, Biden was building a department to punish people based on what they believed was true or not. This is the guy who said you can't catch COVID if you're vaccinated setting up a department to stop the spread of bad information. I would never let people forget that he only pulled that idea because November's around the corner. He still wants to crush your First Amendment rights to free speech. He's just waiting on you to give him more power in a week or two. If you know who she is, I recently sat down with Katie Hopkins on my channel as well as Trevor Loudon. I told Trevor something I find so interesting is that I've been following Katie Hopkins from the UK. Trevor Loudon is from New Zealand. Jordan Peterson is from Canada. Dinesh D'Souza is from India. Please don't tell me conservatives don't like immigrants. We do. In fact, some of the people who are most passionate about America are the ones who just got here because they know exactly what they ran from. We just want people here legally. That's all. We're the greatest country in the world because, in a sense, we are every country in the world. I don't know if you've ever spoke with people who migrate here, but Katie told me she's interested in what happens in the United States because people who vote here somehow holds out hope for Britain. Trevor told me he's interested in what happens in the United States because how people vote here somehow holds out hope for New Zealand. Don't let people fool you. There are a lot of people around here around in the world who look to Americans 
as though we are the last hope for freedom. Trevor told me he travels a lot. If there was a place that was better than America, he'd be there. But he's not. They're all looking at us. We can do better. If I've made you feel like you have a tremendous amount of responsibility on you, good. You do. I'm talking directly to conservatives now. I'm not expecting this message to come from the other side. We have a responsibility to communicate how we are different. Nothing bothers me more when I listen to somebody say, I don't vote. Honestly, there's not much difference between the parties. Bull. There's a life and death difference. Ask the people who just came here. When I hear that, it saddens me. It lets me know I have to have a tough love conversation with my own party because we're not communicating effectively. And communication is more than just talking. The United States has spent over $22 trillion on the so-called war on poverty. In the greatest country in the world, there's absolutely no excuse for companies to say we can't manufacture a product here, we have to build it in China. There's only one reason for both of these things. It's because Republicans have forgotten what it's like to be bold. There are all sorts of policies Democrats have had on the books for over 50 years, and we've let them stand. Quit being cowards. Quit trying to blend in with everybody. Quit trying to be rhinos. Darn it, be memorable. You're an elected official. Effective communication is part of your job. Figure out the best way to explain what you need to say, but stop sitting on your hands. In sales, many times there are two kinds of salespeople. There are the salespeople who rely on your emotions to make a sale, and there are the salespeople who rely on facts and figures to make a sale. The debate among salespeople for the longest time has been, what works best to influence people? Emotions or logic? The truth is, it's both. People make decisions based on emotion, but they justify their decisions with logic. The person who gets this will get their point across. Stop being the Republican who always talks about quoting taxes and facts and figures. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. At this point, Trent's, someone's probably whispering in Trent's ear and says, is this the guy we invited for the motivational talk? <laughs> so listen, I'm, I'm getting there. Despite the work that we have to do, I'm actually excited. I'm excited because the Democrat Party have built their house on the sands of multiculturalism, and that house is starting to crumble. The Democrat Party, the more that I'm reading about them, they're becoming the party of the rich. That's not a good look for a party that trashes rich people. I'm reading more articles suggesting that the working class is leaving. That's not a good look for a party that represents the middle class. Slowly, blacks are leaving the Democrat Party. Slowly, uh, Latinos are leaving the Democrat Party. And the party is becoming more and more the party of rich white people, which in and of itself wouldn't be a problem if it weren't for their history with Jim Crow. That's right. History is starting to repeat itself. More and more Americans are joining the Republican Party and leaving the Democrat Party, and I'm here for every second of it. In our Georgia election, I've volunteered and have attended a number of rallies for our governor, Brian Kemp. Democrat Stacey Abrams is actually confused. The polling, the latest polling data says that she has a problem with black men. They don't seem to like her. What? You mean all people don't vote based on skin color? Imagine that. So Kemp is winning. They can't figure us out. They can't pin us down. She thought Kemp was a mini version of Trump. She thought she could ride that Trump hate wave all the way into office. Someone didn't tell Stacey that Republicans are individualists. We're not carbon copies of each other. In the world of soft power, Don Lemon from CNN just got demoted. Brian Salter is out. On The Daily Show, Trevor Noah is gone. The message is becoming clear. Go woke, go broke. I mean, what's the world coming to when Bill Maher is starting to sound like a conservative? Name a time when you've seen this many black conservative political commentators in your life. Never. I don't care who the president was. I've never seen so many black people excited about changing the direction of this country. Whether you love Trump or hate him, I'm sorry, I don't recall any black political personalities who became popular after eight years of Obama. 
That's saying something. Our message is resonating. Forbes wrote an article about the Daily Wire. The Daily Wire now boasts some 890,000 paid subscribers. That's huge. People are putting their money where their mouths are. They released a documentary called What is a Woman? It received 83% on Rotten Tomatoes with an audience score of 96% and it wasn't even released in the theaters. Candace Owens, just last week, released her documentary called The Greatest Lie Ever Sold about BLM and George Floyd. I'm loving this. Do you know why? Because for too long, conservatives have taken this laissez-faire approach about uh, soft power. We sat back and left, let the left dominate culture. I'm excited to see what's happening right now because we're not sitting back. Conservatives are actually changing the culture from comedians to news outlets to radio shows, from influencers to musicians and educators, from elected officials to movies, even clothing, there's a clear pattern starting to emerge. All of the trends are showing that everything that's woke is failing, while liberty and freedom is on the rise. There's a change brewing, and it's all because of people like you. I'd like you guys to do one last thing for me here. Can everyone stand up? This is gonna seem weird. What I'd like you to do is put your hands on your hips, and I'd like you, keep your feet planted in place, turn as far as you can around, as far as you can. And when you get as far as you can, I want you to make note of where you stopped. Turn as far as you can, okay? Now, when you've reached that part, come back, okay? Do you remember where you stopped? Okay, close your eyes, take a deep breath. This time, you're gonna do the same exercise, but just in your mind. I want you to see yourself doing the exact same thing you just did. I want you to imagine your body turning slowly around and this time, I want you to see yourself going past that mark you saw before. As a matter of fact, I want you to see yourself going 50% further than you did before. Do you see it? All right, take another deep breath. Close your eyes one more time. I want you to imagine yourself doing the exact same thing you just did. I want you to see yourself turning slowly, slowly around, but this time, it's freaky, it's weird. You see your body turning completely around, almost to the point where you're facing the front again. Okay, open your eyes. Now go back and turn as far as you can physically, like you did before. All right. How many of you went further this time than you did the last time? Look at those hands. So here's the million dollar question. When I told you to go as far as you could the first time, was that really all you could do? Or did you just discover that you had more in you than you realized? All of us are much stronger inside than we realize. I'm Rob Lett, and I approve this message. Thank you, Idaho.